Welcome back. So last time we were talking about how if you have two pure tones with different frequencies, that if those frequencies are too close together, then you experience some kind of unpleasantness or roughness in the combination. And we understood that biologically that has to do with the fact that both of those tones are trying to excite regions on the basilar membrane that are very close together um, or in particular overlapping if the tones are too close together. And if we have that, then there's this roughness or unpleasantness that we experience that is not there if we send one of those tones to one ear and one to the other. So that's how we know that it's, it's really a phenomenon of trying to send both of those two tones with close enough frequencies together into the same ear. And so this phenomenon of, of this roughness or unpleasantness um, when you have two pure tones close together, uh, this is sort of an origin for some of the dissonance that we understand in music. And so what we wanna talk about today is kind of the opposite of that. I wanna talk about why certain combinations of notes actually sound harmonious together why we think certain notes sound good together and we use them in harmonies in music. And, you know, if we just think about it, well, you could make the frequencies far enough apart that they're not competing with each other on the basilar membrane, but then there's still an infinite number of choices. And if you look at the structure of typical musical compositions, in whatever musical tradition you want, then usually out of this infinite number of possibilities, there are just certain particular combinations of frequencies that end up getting used. So why is it that typical musical scales and chords and intervals are using these specific combinations of frequencies? That's our goal for today is to try to understand this. So just some terminology. When we talk about a musical interval, um, this is a pair of notes that have a certain relationship with one another. And mathematically, this is a pair of notes whose frequencies have a specific ratio. So in terms of our perception, when that is the case, when the frequencies have a specific ratio, we perceive the same relation between the two notes. And so let me give you some examples. So we've talked about the idea of an octave, that if I go from one note with a certain frequency to a note with a frequency that is double that, then this is, this is what we call an octave. We experience those two notes as being very closely related. So that would be an octave. Uh, we In music, it's actually common to refer to those things as the same note. We use the same letter C to refer to the low note and the high note, even though they're clearly different frequencies. But those frequencies are related by this particular ratio of two to one. We can consider another note And so, <clears throat> again, even though that first note is a different note, then we experience that same difference in the, in the, in the two notes. So we, we think of the relationship between and as the same musical relationship as the relationship between. So if we wanted to play the song uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, we could start on any note and the start of that song, the second note would be one octave above. And even though the, the, if you looked at the frequencies, um, they would be, they would be, you could, you could choose whatever frequency you want to start on. And as long as the next note, the second note was double the frequency of the first note, you would recognize it as the start of the song somewhere over the rainbow. Okay. Or, So this is the notion of a musical instrument. This is why, uh, sorry, of a musical interval. This is why 
um, doesn't really matter what the note you start on, uh, we can define that same interval for any note. Um, and it turns out that mathematically, the same interval starting on whatever note you want uh, means that the two notes in the interval have the same ratio of frequencies. And so if you look at standard music, then the same kinds of intervals or the same ratios of frequencies come up over and over and over again. And there's a reason for it, which is, or, or there's a, an observation, which is that these particular intervals that come up the most frequently in music, they have very simple ratios of frequencies. So this should, should say simple frequency ratios. There's an extra N in there. Um, and so what I mean by simple ratios is ratios involving small integers. So two to one or three to two or three to four. Whereas a complicated ratio would be 17 to 24 or, so, or the square root of two or so, something, um, something more um, mathematically complicated than the ratio of simple integers. Okay, so let's talk about some examples. The octave that I just played, we said that was a two to one ratio of frequencies. Uh, the next most common musical instrument uh, interval, one that appears in many musical scales across different musical traditions would be the perfect fifth. And so that sounds like this. The first two notes of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. So I could, I could start Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star on, again, on any note. And the, when the next note, when I go up higher in that melody, is that's kind of our definition of a perfect fifth in terms of the way we perceive it. And so if you figure out what those frequencies are, then regardless of what you start with, the, note, the frequency of the second note that comes up in Twinkle Twinkle Little Star is going to be three, three over two or 1.5 times the frequency of the first note. Okay, and so it's a very simple ratio involving just these small numbers, three and two. Um, the next simplest ratio we could come up with, well, we could allow ourselves to use the next smallest whole number, which is four. And so four over one would just be uh, two octaves. Uh, four over two, that's the same as two over one. So that's a, an octave again. And then we could have four over three, which is a new ratio. And that's the one that corresponds to what's known as a perfect fourth. Uh, so that would, that would sound like this. Sorry, that was, a, that was a fifth again. The perfect fourth would be this one. So uh, when I was taking piano lessons in elementary school, that ratio, the perfect fourth, was introduced to me as the start of the song, Hi-Ho, Hi-Ho, It's Off to Work We Go from Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Um, so it's, it's uh, common to actually associate these musical instruments with the beginnings of particular songs to help us remember what they sound like. So one of the interesting things about the perfect fifth and the perfect fourth is that together these things form an octave. And so if you go up a perfect fifth and then from there you go up a perfect fourth, then that combined interval is an entire octave. And so what that means is even if you just had fifths and octaves, you could actually construct a perfect fourth by going up an octave and then down a fifth, and the result would be a perfect fourth. Okay, so just a brief aside here, I wanted to mention that later when we talk about the, the say the notes on a piano, or the standard musical notes, the fre standard frequencies that have been assigned to musical notes, um, the intervals in that case are slightly, slightly different from these ones. So 
if you play a perfect fifth on a piano, it's not exactly three over two in terms of the ratio of frequencies. And if you play a perfect fourth, it's not exactly four over three. And I will tell you the reason for that coming up in the next video. But for now, I'll just emphasize that there's sl slight differences. So these ratios are what we call the ratios in just tuning. These are in some sense the most natural ratios of frequencies that we would associate with the fifth or the fourth. Uh, the octave is always, um, I, as far as I know, the octave is always uh, an exact doubling of the frequency. Okay, so just so that we have, uh, just make sure we're understanding this, um, I want you to think about the following question. So this is just a standard thing you might want to do. We play one note with a frequency of 600 hertz. And then I want to know what is the frequency of a note that is a fifth above that, a perfect fifth above that, or a perfect fifth below that. So take a minute to just do that calculation and remembering that the perfect fifth is a three to two ratio of notes. And then I'm going to go over it now. And so basically it's a straightforward calculation where we use the starting frequency and so that's 600 Hertz. So I guess the easy one here is going up a perfect fifth. And so I said, well, this is a three to two ratio of frequencies. And so in going up a perfect fifth from 600 Hertz, what you want to do is take 600 Hertz and then multiply by three over two or 1.5. And so that is going to get you 900 hertz. Uh, if you want to do the opposite of that, so instead of multiplying by 3 over 2, what we want to do in order to go down a perfect fifth is actually to divide by that same amount. Okay, so we want to take um, 600 hertz and divide, so this is my division symbol, uh, divide that by 3 over 2 or 1.5 and that ends up being 400 hertz. Okay, another way to think about that is in terms of um, just multiplying by the, the inverse ratio. Okay, so you could also equivalently take 600 hertz and multiply by 2 over 3 and that would also give you 400 hertz. And so the reason why, um, that, why that, that would be another way to think about it is you're just kind of doing the opposite of what you did to go up a fifth. So to go up a fifth, you multiply by three, divide by two, and then to reverse that, if you wanted to come back down a fifth, you'd need to multiply by two and divide by three, or just multiply by two thirds, and then you'd be back down to 600. And then if you go down another fifth, from 600, so that would be taking 600 and multiplying by two and dividing by three again. Okay, and so this is like a really important, when, when we're going up musical intervals, it's always multiplying our frequencies by a certain amount. And we're going down musical intervals, we're dividing our frequencies by a certain amount or multiplying by the inverse of those ratios that correspond to the intervals. So we can we can go further and um, and hear what it sounds like if you have these other intervals. And so if you have the next simplest integer that we could use to make ratios would be the, the integer five, so five over four. And so this corresponds to what we call a major third or That one's uh, probably a little sharp on my recorder. Uh, a major sixth is the ratio of five over three. So, and if we go to the next integer six, then we can build uh, another very important um, interval, which is a minor third.
Okay, well, it sounds like, so it turns out that um, these intervals also sound good if you play both notes at the same time. And so in constructing chords in music, we're often playing multiple frequencies at the same time. So I just wanted to demonstrate what it sounds like to have these various intervals and actually play the frequencies at the same time. So I'll just play, um, these are going to be two notes at a time. And I'll take the lowest, the lower one to be 300 hertz. And I will change the upper one to correspond to these various intervals. Okay. So here is the, here is the octave. And so, so again, that higher note, in some sense, we perceive it as being, in, in a way, the same note. We, we would call it the same note musically, a C up to a C or an A up to an A. Um, and the ratio of frequencies is exactly two to one. Here's the perfect fifth, uh, so with a three to two ratio. And so I just want to contrast that with uh, what it sounds like if, if I change up the ratio a little bit from that perfect three to two ratio. So let's just add, um, I don't know, 10, 10 hertz to our, our upper one uh, and hear what that sounds like. So I'll, I'll add 10 hertz to the, instead of 450, I'll play 460 and then I'll go back down to the perfect fifth and we'll see what that sounds like. So. Okay, so it kind of resolved there. There was some tension and it resolved when I back, went down to the perfect fifth. I'll do the same thing, but going up. So I'll, I'll go down by, I don't know, let's try uh, 450. I'll go to 438. So again, not quite a perfect fifth. And now resolve. Okay, and so, so now we'll try, we'll just try some of these other intervals just so you can hear what they sound like together. Uh, so the perfect fourth is 300 and 400. The um, major third. Oops, sorry, gotta go 375. So 300 and 375. Uh, so this is a five to four ratio. Okay, so that was very, that's very harmonious. Uh, those are the first two notes in what's called a, a major chord. And now if I go to the six to five ratio, it's what's called a, a minor third. So. And so that, again, it sounds nice together. Um, it's interesting to, to hear the, the feeling that these intervals evoke is different. At least in our, at least in our Western tradition, uh, this major third sound is often considered or perceived to be happier. And the minor third sound is, is perceived to be associated with a darker sound or, or a sadder sound. And I don't know how much of that is um, is true across cultures, or you know whether it's something to do with what we've been exposed to, what that sound has been associated with, in in for example cartoons and films. Um, but at least having experienced all the music that I've experienced in my life, uh, and I think this is true for many people, uh, we certainly associate certain emotions to certain musical intervals. So this is very interesting. Um, let me just play one more interesting interval. Um, so 
All of these ones so far, as we'll discuss, those are intervals that you can play on a piano with the notes that you have on a piano. Uh, but there are other intervals that have relatively simple ratios of frequencies that you really can't play on a piano. Uh, you can play it on, uh, on other instruments where you, you can get a continuous set of tones. So one example is what's called a septimal minor third. So a septimal because we have the number seven appearing in the frequency ratio. And so this is a seven to six ratio. And it turns out to be, in terms of ordinary semitones, that's two and two thirds of a semitone. Okay, so I'll just play, uh, I'll play that. I'm just gonna quickly check to make sure that we are recording indeed we are. So I'm always a little bit paranoid that I'm talking to nothing and then there's nothing being recorded. So this is, this is a septimal minor third. Uh, let's, let's just do that calculation. So we wanna take uh, 300 Hertz and then we want to multiply by seven over six. And so that, that, I guess I might have even been able to do that in my head. It's 350 hertz. Um, so here it goes, an unfamiliar interval, but still one that I think has a very interesting sound. Okay, and actually just, to, just for fun, I'll play a, I'll play a chord that um, it uses that uses that interval. So let's, let's do that. Um, so I was playing around the other day just with, uh, with the septimal minor third. And so I just adding a, a note on top. Um, so this is like a major third is, is the, a note and then a th major third above that. And then the fifth above that or above the original note. So that's, that's a major chord. Uh, the minor chord is the original note, a minor third above that, and then a fifth above the original note. And, and so we could try to build some kind of a chord using the septimal minor third. So here's, here's one possibility. All right, so that was fun. That's that's some kind of a I'll call it a septimal septimal minor chord. The, the top frequency I was using there was uh, four hundred and thirty eight hertz. So it's it's not quite a it's not quite a fifth um, ab above the original note. So this is just using some intervals that you can't really play on a piano. You get an interesting chord that I, I, to me, it has a very dark sound to it. I'm not sure what you experienced. Okay, so I wanna talk about why we find these combinations of notes to be pleasing or harmonious. You know, it's one thing to say that, well, these have really nice ratios of frequencies. So yes, they're mathematically pleasing, but how does our brain deal with this information? So we hear these two notes, we're not really aware that one of them is 300 hertz and the other one is 400 hertz. We're not aware that you get that perfect four to three ratio of frequencies. So why is it that we find the four to three ratio more pleasant than something close by that wouldn't have a nice ratio? So I'm gonna give you a couple of possible answers. And I would say that this is something that's not completely understood in terms of our psychology, uh, but there's a couple of very plausible answers based on things that we've learned already. Okay, so the first one is that these intervals with simple ratios of frequencies, those intervals already appear naturally even when we're just listening to a single note that isn't a pure tone. So remember, when you had the note of a guitar or a trumpet or a saxophone, then we understood that this is not just a single frequency, but instead a whole series of frequencies which are processed together by our brain and kind of combined into a single note. So when you hear a, a 
100 hertz on a saxophone, you're really hearing 100 hertz, 200 hertz, 300 hertz, 400 hertz, 500 hertz, and so forth all together. And if you look at the various individual frequencies in that harmonic series, then they would have these simple integer uh, relations or whole number uh, ratios of frequencies. Okay, so the second note is exactly twice the frequency of the first note. So the first two notes in the harmonic series define an octave. The next two notes in the harmonic series define a perfect fifth. The next two define a perfect fourth. Next two define a major third and then a minor third. The combination of these ones is a major sixth. And so all of those very simple intervals, they are already present when you're just hearing a single note on a complex instrument that's not just playing a pure tone. So we're used to hearing these combinations of frequencies together. And so I think it makes sense that when we kind of isolate things and play the pure tones at those specific frequencies, that we find it natural that those come together. We find it pleasing to hear those two frequencies together. Okay, so that is one way to understand this. But there's a, a separate way that I think contributes to the reason why two notes in one of these nice intervals actually sound good to us. And other kinds of pairs of notes where you have ratios of frequencies um, that aren't simple, why those ones sound more dissonant. Okay, and, and so to understand that, we have to remember that you actually get the harmonics above the fundamental when you're playing these notes on anything but like a, a tuning fork or, or the sine wave generator that I was using here. So normally when we're hearing notes in the context of music, when we're hearing a fifth, we're not just hearing two frequencies, we're hearing the, the bottom note plus all of its harmonics and we're hearing the top note plus all of its harmonics. So what I've done on this slide is to just show those various frequencies that are involved in simple cases and in one more complicated interval. Okay, so let's start with the left one. So this is an octave. And so on the left, you have all of the frequencies that are present in the low note that I've taken to be 100 hertz. So you get 100, 200, 300, 400, and so forth. And on the right, I have all of the frequencies that are present in the higher note. And so what you see is that you get the frequencies in the higher note exactly lining up with the frequencies, some of the frequencies in the lower note. So for an octave, that's true. There's this perfect match where all of the frequencies are actually already present. And so I think that helps explain why when we hear an octave above another note, that in some ways it's it sounds like it's almost the same note that it's not really um, that's not really changing the note um, in in a complicated way. Okay, what about a fifth? So that definitely includes new frequencies that we didn't already have. So the fundamental frequency is different than the fundamental frequency of our original note. But then the first harmonic of that fifth lines up perfectly. And the second harmonic doesn't line up perfectly, but it's right in between. It's not too close to either of those harmonics. The third one lines up perfectly again, and the fourth one is right in between. And so another way to say that it, this is that if you, if you look at all of these frequencies, well, it turns out that they're all harmonics of a note that is an octave below this first note. Okay, so why is this important? that the notes either line up perfectly or they're well spaced. Well, remember in our discussion of dissonance, we said that things sound bad if you have two tones that are competing for the same space on the basilar membrane. Okay, and so, so if, you have, if you have two tones that are too close together, then they're exciting regions on the basilar membrane that are really close together and that leads to some unpleasantness. So when you have these simple intervals like an octave or a fifth, well then we avoid that, as you can see from the pictures. 
if on the other hand we consider something like the interval of a tritone so this is another interval it's like a c going up to an f sharp um, so let me let me try to play that um, let's let's play uh let's go So it's a, uh, at least it has more tension to it. And if I play them at the same time, let me just play that at the same time for you to hear what a what a tritone sounds like. Um, so this would be, let me do the calculation. One eight four one. Okay, so this is this is a ratio of one point. It's the square root of two. Uh, one point four one four two one. Okay, so, so that would be 300 hertz together with um, 424.263. And so let's hear that. Okay, so that's de it's definitely a bit jarring um, in terms of how it sounds compared to those earlier harmonious intervals and so if we if we look at it well that first frequency it's in between the fundamental of our original note and the first and the second harmonic um, so that one doesn't seem to clash it seems like it could be well separated from both of those but if you go up to the second harmonic of the of the higher note then you notice that that is close to but not exactly equal to the th the third harmonic of our original note okay, so there's going to be a clash there those two tones together are going to produce some unpleasantness and similarly with the next pair of harmonics again there's going to be a clash there because those are close to each other but not exactly equal to each other and there's more happening up in the higher harmonics where you get close to but not exactly the same frequencies and so we understood that in terms of our basilar membrane then you're going to get um, you know you're trying to you're trying to excite the same region with two close tones and so those are going to kind of uh, mess with each other and we'll perceive that roughness or unpleasantness or dissonance so, so just to review then, notes that we find harmonious together, um, these things, if we look at the ratio of frequencies, then you get simple, simple, inter, simple intervals, or sorry, simple ratios involving small integers. The reason why that might sound nice together or harmonious to us it's partly that we're used to hearing those sounds together because those ratios appear in our harmonic series. So whenever you hear a single note played by a musical instrument, you're already hearing pure tones in these nice ratios of frequencies. And then we also understood that when we're talking about more complicated tones, that if you choose the fundamental frequencies to have simple ratios, then you're going to avoid these higher frequencies clashing with each other. You're gonna avoid having harmonics that don't quite agree, that are close in frequency, but not equal in frequency, like you had in the, in the tritone. Okay, so next time we're gonna talk about how to go from this concept of simple intervals to the idea of building up more complicated musical structures that appear. So we'll talk about chords and we'll talk about the various kinds of scales that appear in various different musical traditions.